All right, here's the rest of the chapter. I'm gonna reread the last paragraph I read in the previous video. An old house without a speck of paint on it stood tall on the bluff. Its outbuildings had caved in and the privy stood at an angle. There were still prairie chickens around in those days and they were pecking the dirt. Otherwise, the place looked lifeless. Rags hung at the windows. The porch overlooking the creek had fallen off. Grandma tramped around to the far side of the house. She dropped her fish on the ground and waved us inside. Even in full daylight, the place looked haunted. I didn't want to go in, but Mary Alice was marching through the door already. So I had to. Is anybody inside? I whispered to Grandma as I lugged her hamper past her. Nobody but Aunt Puss Chapman, she said. Like anybody would know that. It had been a fine house once. A wide black walnut staircase rose to a landing window with most of its stained glass still in it. But it was creepy in here, dim and dusty. Smelled funny too. We went into a room piled up with furniture. Then one of the chairs spoke. Where you been, girl? Mary Alice flinched, but the old woman lost in the chair was staring straight at grandma and calling her girl. She was by many years the oldest person we'd ever seen up till then. Bald as an egg, but she needed a shave and not a tooth in her head. Who's them cheerin with you? She demanded of grandma. Just kids I found along the creek bank, grandma said to our surprise. They was fishing. I don't know as I want them in my house. Aunt Puss Chapman sent us a mean look. Do they steal? Nothing you've got, Grandma said under her breath. Talk up, girl, Aunt Puss said. You mumble. I've spoken to you about that before. She pulled her shawl closer, though it was the hottest day of the year. I'm hungry. You tie-tailed it out of here after breakfast, and I ain't seen hat nor hoof mark of you since. She ain't seen me for a week, Grandma mumbled to us, but she forgets. Then she called out to Aunt Puss, catfish and fried potatoes and onions, vinegar slaw and a pickled peach apiece, and more of the same for your supper. I suppose it beats starving. Aunt Puss snapped, but hop to it, girl, stir your stumps. I thought I might faint again. Nobody could talk to grandma like that and live. She led us back to an old time kitchen. It was in bad shape, but well stocked. Big sacks of potatoes and onions, cornmeal, things in cans. And we'd brought a full hamper to add to Aunt Puss's larder. I had to fire up the stove with a bunch of kindling while Grandma and Mary Alice went to work on the potatoes and onions. Mary Alice was in as big a daze as I was. Grandma, is that nasty old lady your aunt? I stopped to listen. If she was, that made her our great-great aunt. No. Nah. I was hired girl to her before I was married. A hired girl, that'd be like a maid and cook, Grandma said. Lived in this house and fetched and carried for her and slept in the attic. You had a room in the attic? No, I just slept up there. I had a bed tick with straw in it and changed it every spring. I haven't always lived in the luxury you see me in now. What did she pay you, Grandma? Pay? She didn't pay me a plug nickel, but she fed me. I thought about that. And now you feed her, I said, but Grandma didn't reply. We cleaned the fish on a plank table outdoors. I didn't care much for it, 
It made me kind of sick to hear Grandma rip the skin off the catfish. She had her own quick way of doing that, but every time it sounded like the fish screamed. She put me in charge of chopping off their heads, but I didn't like the chopping off the head of anything looking back at me. And catfish have mustaches for some reason, which is just plain weird. Finally, Mary Alice took the rusty hatchet out of my hand and whomp, she'd bring down the blade and that fish head would go flying. Mary Alice was good at it, so I let her do it. Grandma gutted. It was afternoon before we sat down at the dining room table under, the co under a cobwebby gasolier. I think a gasolier must be like a, a chandelier, but instead of candles, it has little gas lamps in it, maybe. Aunt Puss was already at her place, so she was spryer than she looked. Grandma settled at the foot of the table. Without her hat, her white hair hung in damp tendrils. We'd been working like a whole pack of bird dogs. Watching Aunt Puss gum catfish was not a pretty sight. These fish taste muddy, she observed. You uns catch them? Yes, I said. No, Mary Alice said. What did you use for bait? Aunt Puss said, looking at both of us. Cheese, I said. Worms. Mary Alice said more wisely. Since we couldn't get, a, get together on our story, Aunt Puss changed the subject. <laughs> you children still in school? We nodded. Do they whoop ya? Do they what? Mary Alice said. <laughs> Do they paddle your behind when you need it? Aunt Puss looked interested. <laughs> well, if they did, I'd quit school, said Mary Alice who had just completed third grade. They whooped that girl raw. Aunt Puss pointed her fork down the table at Grandma. I had a sudden thought. Aunt Puss thought Grandma and Mary Alice and I were all about the same age. She hadn't noticed the years passing. That's why Grandma didn't say we were her grandkids it would just have mixed Aunt Puss up. That's when she come to work for me. They'd throwed her out of school. Aunt Puss peered down the table. Tell them why. We looked at Grandma, naturally interested to know why she'd been throwed, thrown out of school. Grandma waved us away. I forget, she said. I don't, Aunt Puss waved a fork. It was because you wadded up your under drawers to stop up the flu on the stove and smoke out the schoolhouse. That was the end of your education. Working for you was an education, Grandma muttered, though only Mary Alice and I heard. <laughs> she wadded up her underpants and stuck them in the... The flu is like the pipe that leads the smoke out of your house from a from like a wood stove they would have used for heating so that all of the smoke filled up the schoolhouse. <laughs> it took us another hour to clean up the kitchen the way Grandma wanted to leave it. When it was time for us to go, Aunt Puss was back in her chair in the parlor. Where do you think you're off to now? She called out as we trooped through the front hall. Down to, slide, down to the sty to slop the hogs, Grandma called back. Well, don't dawdle. You dawdle, and I've spoken to you about that before. Get on out of here, Aunt Puss hollered. Let the door hit you where the dog bit you. Outdoors, I said. Does she have hogs? She used to, Grandma said. She was right well off at one time. She's poor now, but she don't know it. How could she? She still had her hired girl and plenty to eat. You take her food every week, don't you, Grandma? Generally a good big roast chicken. She can gum that for days. Grandma turned down the lane. It keeps her out of the poor farm and it gives me a quiet day in the country. That's a fair swap. 
Then her jaw clenched in its way. But it's just private business between her and me. And I don't tell my private business. Hmm. So Grandma does something kind of nice, doesn't she? Hmm. We walked country roads all the way home. Grandma set a brisk pace, and I struggled along behind with a hamper heavy with cleaned catfish. Mary Alice went in the middle, watching where she walked. By the time we got home, the trees in Grandma's yard were throwing long shadows, and it was evening in her kitchen. Mary Alice and I were both staggering. I was ready to go straight up to bed. But Grandma said, skin down to the cellar and bring up 15 or 20 bottles of my beer. Just carry two at a time. I don't want any broke. I whimpered. But she was turning on Mary Alice. Then you and me's gonna fry up a couple pecks of potatoes to go with the fish. There won't be nothing to it. I peeled the potatoes this morning before you two was up. We stared. The catfish fried in long pans with the potatoes and onions at the other end, popping in the grease. The kitchen was blue with smoke, and the night was at the windows before we finished up. Now get down every platter I own, she told me. Then she set, sent me for the card table I'd used for my jigsaw puzzle of Charles A. Lindbergh. Following her lead, we carried everything out into the night, making many trips. We lugged it all across the road and up to the Wabash Railroad right of way and planted the card table in the gravel. Finally, the platters of fish and potatoes overlapped on the table and the opened beer bottles stood in a row beside the tracks. As the drifters came along, being hounded out of town, Grandma gave them a good feed and a beer to wet their whistles. Mary Alice helped in an apron of grandma's that dragged the ground. They were hollow-eyed men who couldn't believe their luck. Two or three of them, then five or six, then a bunch standing around the table, eating with both hands, sharing out the beer. They didn't say much. They didn't thank her. She wasn't looking for thanks. She'd taken off her overalls and put the same wash dress back on, but she'd tied a fresh apron over it. Her hair was a mess, fanning out from the bun at the back, white in the moonlight. She watched them feed, working her mouth. Then we saw the swinging lanterns, the sheriff and his deputies coming along behind to keep the drifters moving. Up trooped O.B. Dickerson, dressed now, with his badge on and his belt full of bullets riding low under his big belly. His deputies loomed behind him, but they weren't singing Sweet Adeline. Okay, okay, break it up, he said, elbowing through the drifters. Then he came to Grandma. Dag nabbit, Mrs. Dowdell, you're everywhere I turn. You're all over me like white on rice. Now what do you think you're doing? I'm giving these boys the first eats they've had today. Or yesterday, a drifter said. Mrs. Dowdell, let me explain something to you, the sheriff bawled. We don't want to feed these loafers. We want them out of town. They're out of town. Grandma pointed her spatula at the sheriff's feet. The town stops here. We're in the country. Yes, and I'm the sheriff of the county. Oh, we're in the county, O.B. Dickerson bellowed. You're in my jurisdiction. Do tell, Grandma said. Run me in. The minute she said that, all the drifters looked up. That was when Sheriff Dickerson's deputies saw they were outnumbered. Mrs. Dowdell the sheriff boomed. I wouldn't know what to charge you with first. You're a one woman crime wave. Where'd you get them fish, for instance? He said, wisely overlooking the home bruise in the drifter's hands. <laughs>
Out of a trap in Salt Creek, Grandma remarked. Same as you get yours. <clears throat> Obie Dickerson's eyes bulged. You accusing me, the sheriff of Pyatt County, of running fish traps? He poked his own chest with a pudgy finger. Not this morning, Grandma replied. You was too drunk. The drifters chuckled. And talking about this morning, the sheriff said, his face shading purple even in the darkness. You stole my boat. That's what we call larceny, Mrs. Dow Dowdell. You could go up for that. Ah, oh, well, the boat. Grandma made a little gesture with the spatula. You'll find it tied up at Aunt Puss Chapman's dock. As a rule, I take it back where you tie it up, but of course I couldn't do that this morning. How could I row these grandkids of mine back past the Rod and Gun Club? They'd already seen what no child should. The sheriff and his deputies, blind, drunk, and naked as jaybirds, dancing jigs on the porch, and I don't know what all. I'd like to have marked this girl for life. Grandma nudged Mary Alice, who stood there in the big apron, looking drooped and damaged. I'm thinking about taking her to the doctor so she can talk about it. I don't want her to develop one of them complexes you hear about. Whoa, the deputies murmured behind Sheriff Dickerson. Earl T. Askew stepped up and said into his ear, O.B., let's just let sleeping dogs lie. I got my hands full with Mrs. Askew as it is. So they're saying, don't take her in or our wives are going to find out how badly we behaved. Go look it up, O.B. Oh, wait, I missed a paragraph, sorry. The sheriff simmered but said, Okay, Earl, if you say so. The sheriff and his posse were in retreat now, but he had to cover himself. Mrs. Dowdell, he said, pulling a long face. These things I can overlook, but it seems to me you're running a soup kitchen without a license from the Board of Health. I have an idea there's a law against that on the books. Go look it up, O.B., Grandma said. See if there's a law against feeding the hungry. But I have to tell you, you've talked so long, the evidence is all laid up. And of course it was. The drifters had wolfed down the last morsel. With a small finger, Mary Alice pointed out the bare platters. Only a faint scent of fried catfish lingered on the night air. The empty beer bottles went without saying. The drifters were moving off down the track, and the deputies were heading back into town. O.B. Dickerson spit in the gravel, swung around, and followed them, his big boots grinding gravel. We stacked the platters and rounded up the beer bottles for Grandma's next batch. I collapsed the legs on the card table. There wasn't a lot of music in Grandma, but she was humming as she worked, and I thought I recognized the tune. She was singing something that the drunk sheriff was singing. Then, after our quiet day in the country, we carried everything back across the road under a silver dollar moon. That's the end of the chapter.